this evening we have a, a local uh, celebrity with us. <laughs> I told her that this is one of our, our biggest turnouts, so either the topic is very appealing or she is one or the other, or both, maybe both. <laughs> a lot of you probably know, a lot of you know Kenda Bond. Uh, Kenda is actually from Kansas, Illinois, in the eastern part of the state. But uh, she has been a resident of Washington for years, and she taught approximately 30 years, uh, a, a third grade in the Low Point Washburn District. And some of you may know her husband, Carl, who taught social studies in District 52. And Kenda has an interest in the signs and the symbols that hobos left that, and what they meant for each other. And um, so she's going to share that topic with us this evening. So welcome, Kenda. I don't know whether to thank Sue now or never, but uh, I will say thank you for inviting me to uh, come and speak to you tonight. And she was uh, commenting that I had an interest in signs. I had an interest in quilts before I got into the hobo signs. So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of the hobo history, and then I'll also talk about some of the hobo signs. And um, then we'll have some time at the end if you want to share your hobo stories, because I'm sure you all have some hobo stories. So if you'd like to share uh, some brief ones at the very end, you may do that too. Well, how did I get interested in hobos? Uh, I was first interested in quilts, like I said, and it was just five years ago um, this January that I took my first quilting lessons up at uh, the quilt shop here in town. And then I heard about the uh, quilt classes being offered in Metamora by Debbie Henniger. And you went every Saturday, or first Saturday of the month, they would teach you how to do the square. And then um, you had the month to do that square. You went back the next month, and then they taught you how to do the next one, and then you went home and did it. So that in a year's time, you had 12 uh, squares. And of course, it was the um, squares of the uh, hobo signs. Well, I was more interested in quilting and learning how to quilt in the trains. And then I said, oh, this would be a wonderful lesson to give to the DAR. And uh, so then I said, oh, well then, if I'm going to give it to the DAR, I need to have a history of the hobos. So that's when I started uh, to do the history of the signs. Now, I have to give Debbie Hennegar a lot of credit for this. Um, she is the one who designed all of the squares. Uh, she's also written the book, uh, and she has 55 of the hobos uh, squares in here. And then she's also collected from the uh, United States Congress, uh, the library there, stories of the hobos and pictures and so forth. So uh, afterwards, take a look at the book that she's written. And I'll have to give her a lot of credit. And she also gives speeches on quilts and on the hobos uh, signs. So let me read the introduction to her book to you first. And she's the one that's writing this introduction. When I was a child, my mom, Juanita Penman, would tell the story of her great-grandmother feeding the hobos. Her great-grandmother was an excellent cook, and the fence post was marked to let all hobos know that they could be fed there if they did chores. My mother also taught my sister, Cindy, and me to sew as young girls. I carried those lessons with me and have owned and operated quilt shops for over 13 years. I'm always on the hunt for new, fun ideas to put into the quilts. These facts, combined with a love of family history and a degree in sociology, made this book unnatural for me. Most people I talk to have a connection with hobo lore. Whether their family fed the hobos, worked for the railroads, or were hobos. From the 1880s to the 1940s, hobos were a part of the American life. 
with up to 250,000 travelers on the road at one time. Some viewed the hobos as dirty, hard-drinking, untrustworthy bums. Most saw them as honest, honorable people caught in extraordinary times. All would agree, however, that the railroads crisscrossing the country were the lifeblood of every hobo. Hobo signs were their secret language. They gave direction and advice to the savory travel, traveler, including where to find food, water, a place to sleep, and possibly work. Based on these signs, hobos could tell how they would be received by a homeowner, the police, a community, or even a dog. The meanings of hobo signs reflect all signs of the transient life, from the honorable to the unsavory. These signs also tell the story of what it took to survive as a hobo. Most importantly, this subculture was a significant part of the American history that is worthy of remembrance. Um, so let's learn a little bit about their hobo, about the hobos, and let's look at the history of hobos. She does not include the history of hobos in her books. Uh, she just has the signs, pictures, and little hobo stories. So let's learn a little bit about hobos. Well, where did the name hobo come from? It originally meant ho boys and it was a pre-Civil War term. And the boys that walked and went from farm to farm to hoe in the gardens and estates of the very wealthy were called the hoe boys. And so now it was shortened hobos. And they were also known as our first American migrant workers. After the Civil War, of course that was the Industrial Revolution, and the rapid development of the railroads. The hobo was a, a laboring man with many talents and traits, wandering the country for work, not to be confused with a, a tramp who didn't work. So I'd like to read uh, one of the stories by hobo Ralph Shelley, and he's from Ohio. Eden, Oklahoma was a little western town when the train stopped, I hopped off of the boxcar, along with my buddy. We were both hungry, so we headed for town, but in different directions. There are times when two can be a crowd. I walked through and beyond the center of town and began to see many large but rather dilapidated houses. Behind or beside these homes were many large gardens. And this was a good sign, especially in August. People with large gardens and lawns always had odd jobs for a man to do. I turned in at one friendly looking house. Through the screen door, I saw a woman moving about. This was good. Usually a woman was more sympathetic toward a hungry wanderer. I went up the steps and knocked on that kitchen door. The woman looked up, startled, and said, Yes? She came to the door. Madam, would you have any odd jobs that a man could do for a meal? Odd ah, jobs, is it? Oh, what kind of odd jobs can you do? Well, I can do anything. Uh, let me see your hands, she said. This was a common procedure. The police often used it. It was a means of separating the sheep from the goats, and that is, the hobos from the bums. If your hands were pink and smooth, obviously, you were a bum and never worked. If your hands were rough and calloused, you were a hobo. Hobos were workers, often good workers, but were restless, just couldn't stay in one place, couldn't settle down. The woman was apparently satisfied. Let's see how good you are at digging up potatoes. 
she handed me a garden fork and an empty bushel basket. All right, go to it, she said. An hour later, when I had filled the basket with fresh new potatoes, she came back out and was pleased for what I had done. Good job, boy, she said. Took me into the kitchen to the biggest and the best meal I had in weeks. Plus a couple of sandwiches for the road. And that was by Ralph Shelley from Ohio. So there was a separation between the hobos and the bums. Next in our history, of course, came the Depression time, and more than a million men rode the rails hunting for work, as well as 8,000 women and 200,000 children. Time leading into World War II, there were many hobos. They went into, of course, the three sea camps and then into the army serving in World War II. Afterwards, some took advantage of the GI Bill and entered college or went on into their professions. So after World War II, hobos declined rapidly. There used to be 500 hobos on a full freight train. And in the early 50s, maybe 10 hobos on a freight train. So that ended our history of our hobos. Well, what kind of jobs do these hobos do? They could work in gardens, of course. They repaired railroad tracks. They harvested wheat. They cut down trees. They mined for gold. They herded cattle. They built bridges. They repaired shoes. They made fruit bowls. What did they do in their leisure time? Some of them would have a guitar, but of course traveling across the country was sort of hard to take guitar with you. But what is it that you could easily put in your pocket? Harmonica. So oftentimes they would have a harmonica. They would also have a jackknife because that could easily be put into their pocket and could be used for many different things. And some of them would have wood for whittling and they were known as the stick whittlers. They could carve a ball in a cage in a chain, which is the first time that that was done. They were also storytellers. And you can look at them later, and I know that I'm not up to speed, or I would have a PowerPoint for you, and you could all see it from a distance, but I don't. Um, but this is one of the chains and other little balls on the inside of the chains that the, heart, that the uh, hobos would have made. And so they were the first ones to, be, uh, to know that art. And then some of you might know, and if you're a collector of nickels, that hobos would uh, carve nickels. And um, they would carve them in their spare time, and they would sell them or trade them off for necessities. Many bows were serving time in prison or on chain gangs. And they used to carve them in their cells and give them to guards to gain some favors. The guards, in turn, would sell them and pocket the money. These carved coins are collector items of today. And so the first two on the top are real hobo coins that were made out of wood and they were called the hobo nickels. The bottom two are not real ones. So if you are out there, you need to know the difference. <laughs> okay, let's look a, a little bit at their, the hobo language. Because not only did they have their signs, um, they also had their language in their camps. And each person didn't go by um, their name. They went by their hobo name. They picked out a hobo name. Their camp was called a jungle. And of course, it was always close to the railroad. And it was on the sunny side of the hill and near water. What was their frying pan called? Their frying pans were called banjos. Uh, a person sticking to a job more than a year was called a barnacle. Uh, their prisons were called big houses. And they called each other bows. 
Let me read a story about Bo. <clears throat> Another time after not eating for two days, I stopped at a small grocery store hoping to bum some food. As I stepped in the doorway and a woman followed me in, I motioned to the grocer to wait on her first. She was a cash customer and I was just a beau. The grocer put a few things on the counter and that she had ordered and without warning threw a brown paper bag at me. He knew what I was there for. I stammered my thanks and I stepped out on the sidewalk and looked down. I saw the familiar chalk mark there stating to all bows that the grocer was a kind-hearted, soft-touched guy. The bag held sandwiches, a cake, and an apple. And this was by Frank Kelch from Ohio. Uh, what was a mean dog called? A bone polisher. <laughs> the graveyard was called the bone orchard. Beans were called bullets. Newspapers were called California blankets. A fast train was called the cannonball. You can see where some of our terminology has come from today. Lice were called crumbs. Uh, to board a fast moving train was to flip. <laughs> the busiest road in town, the main drag. The community stew was called mulligan. The part of the jail where um, the minor offenders were all keep, kept together in an iron cage was called the hub. Men hired by the railroads to find the non-paying riders were called the railroad bulls. <coughs> Sometimes hobos would hide in coal cars so that they weren't found or they would hide in the cattle cars. Let me read one other story here. Now remember all of these uh, stories have been collected at Washington DC at the Library of Congress. The year was 1931. My younger brother and I were walking along the railroad tracks which was a short distance from our small town. We each had a bucket looking for chunks of coal that might have fallen from a passing coal car. We could hear a train approaching in the distance, so we went down the embankment and waited for the train to pass. There were freight trains, or freight cars, and sitting on top of one of those box cars was a hobo. From his perch, he could see us with our buckets and immediately jumped up and ran down the row of boxcars until he came to the coal car. He started throwing chunks of coal down to us as fast as he could before the train reached the next crossing. How happy we were, we could fill up our buckets. There was someone who understood and cared. That was by Harriet Dickinson from Indiana. I have two more terms for you. One of them is on the quilt. It's down here in the very corner, so you can't really see it from the back row, but come up later and look at it. But the term is a yegis, and it's by the symbol that meant jail. So what do you think a yegis was? Are you a yegis? Are you a thief? That's what yegis meant in hobo language, is a thief. Uh, and this was uh, another term that came from the hobos, uh, knee shaker. And if a hobo came to your house, uh, the hobo was pretty lucky if they got to go inside the house to sit down to eat. 
but uh, oftentimes they were sitting on the outside on the back stoop. And of course they didn't have paper plates in those days, they had regular plates. So you might have gotten some food on a regular plate and you would be sitting on that back stoop and you were balancing that plate on your knees, the knee shaker. <laughs> there are some famous names, of, uh, names or people that were hobos. Jack London, and he was 18 years old, of course, when he wrote Call of the Wild. Carl Sandburg was a hobo. Pan Jack, Hobo Joe, Greeny, Mr. Bojangles, Boxcar Willie, Steamboat Murray, Ernest Hummingway was a hobo. Art Linkletter, Burl Ives, Jack Dempsey, of course there's many, many, many more. Well, let me read a story about Burl Ives. I was in a jungle one time and a short, heavy bum was singing, or singing with a beautiful voice. He sang ballads and railroad songs, called himself the Wayfaring Stranger. I found out later that it was Burl Ives. And that was written by H.B. Harmon, but his hobo name was Down the Road Doc. And he was from California. And then there were songs that came out of this air. And some of the familiar songs that uh, we would know of today would be Big Rock Candy Mountain and the Hobo Song, which was sung by Jackie, or Johnny Cash, Jesus' Blood Never Failed Me Yet, and King of the Road. So let's look at some of their signs and their symbols. Of course, they were drawn in chalk or on coal, or they were drawn with chalk or with coal on trestles or fences, or buildings, sidewalks, or on trees. My great aunt Iva told me the story of my great grandmother, Jenny Foster Councilman. A hobo came to her door asking to work for food. Jenny was a great cook and was happy to oblige. He chopped a goodly amount of wood and was paid with one of her delicious meals. Soon she was getting more and more of these men and they had fixed everything that she could possibly think of to get done. One day she was talking over the fence with a neighbor woman and explained what was going on. The neighbor said, well, Jenny, if you would take the sign off of your fence in front of your house, it would help. Jenny found the sign that, as explained to me, was some sort of a cross that meant food for work. Jenny had no more hobos at her house. That was by Juanita Penman from Tennessee. And I, I have that. Well, there's, sometimes the signs were different. Uh, but this was the food one, food here if you work. And when uh, she writes this quilting book, she'll have the signs and how to make it and what it means. And then she has these hobo stories that's been collected. So a hobo's life depended upon knowing how to correctly board a train, ride on it, in it, or under it. So, on mine, uh, I have it written here, or embroidered on there, but three lines in a row at a slant like this meant that this is not a safe place to stop. If it was a cross and four lines down, that, mis that meant that a vicious dog lived there. <laughs> of course, this was food here if you worked. In the cross, Talk religion, get food. <laughs> and the tall hat uh, was wealthy. Wealthy people lived at that house. And this is kind of a railroad sign almost with a cross in the middle. Okay, here, good chance for food. 
and afraid. I think that that meant that the uh, people that lived in the house were afraid of hobos. Keep away, if the T was at a diagonal to the left, the cross with the sun, doctor, no charge. And of course, this was a common one with the spades, the two spades that pointed down, and that meant uh, work available. And then this was a house, and it was a well-guarded house. And of course, the jail symbol. So let me read the last story for you that I'm going to read tonight. I arrived in Fargo this evening after a freight train ride on the Chicago Northwestern Railroad from Ortonville, Minnesota. As I walked on a street, I waited as a North, uh, Great Northern freight train was blocking the street. So he's standing there waiting for the train to go by. A neatly dressed young looking fellow struck up a conversation as we waited and I explained that I had arrived from Ohio, still looking for work in the harvest fields. This was a drought year and the grain crop was far from par so I had trouble even getting enough to eat. As the train passed, we continued down the street and as we passed the hotel powers, he asked if I was hungry. Of course I was, but when he started to take me into the coffee shop, I told him I was dirty and didn't think I should go in there. I was glad that he insisted, so I went in with him. He gave some instructions to a pretty red-headed woman, and he left me there to eat. I was served a 50 cent chicken dinner, complete with dessert. In 1933, a 50 cent dinner was a regular banquet. When I asked the waitress about the man, he said, well, that's my boss, Mr. Powers. He runs the hotel. He had also instructed her to give me a room for the night and I was given room 212. The next morning I was told breakfast was waiting for me in the coffee shop. I had never stayed in a hotel in my life, so it was an experience. He gave me more than food and a place to stay. He gave me dignity. And that was Roger Brown, Ohio. Uh, there's anybody that has any uh, hobo stories that they would like to share, or if you have anything to question me about? Yes. I grew up a half a block from the CB and Q Railroad from the West Coast to Chicago. And so at least once a week, from I'd say the late 30s to early 50s, Somebody would come and knock on my folks' back door, and my mother always gave them breakfast without, regardless of what day it was. He sat her on the back porch and ate what we would have eaten. Mm -hmm. I don't know how our house was marked, but without fail, every week, somebody came, jumped off the freight train, marks were like on trees they said or on fences yeah. and oftentimes children did not know about those signs. I didn't that, uh, <laughs> the hobos knew where to look. Yes. The, the one down there in the corner about the jail, why would they have that? Oh, so that I, I guess so that they would know that that was the jailhouse if it, or whatever but maybe so or that that's where it would be. Or, uh, I know she's got it in her book too, the jailhouse yeah. symbol. 
Yes. I was wondering about the one that says wealthy. Mm -hmm. Did the wealthy people have signs at their house and were they receptive to hobos or did that mean you don't have a good chance of stopping? I, I don't know whether they were just a sign that just said that that, you know, a wealthy family lived there and if you wanted to trust them or... Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the um, hobos, of course, would have passed word on from more person to person, too. Um, that well, was. There was a lady in Illinois when I was a kid, and probably, let's see, probably 40, 1940, give or take. The jail was a pretty laid back situation, and if they happened to have a bed, they'd let them stay in overnight. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you almost would have had to it was the jail. jail, right? No, because it sort of blends in with all the other places. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, my dad ran a great establishment in Lake Charles, Illinois, called Lake Charles Hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a There, there are, uh, there's some bad stories too, <laughs> you know, of the hobos, I'm sure. But, um, but the, the pictures in this book, if you have a chance, come up and look at it or I'll take it back out there. But um, these are, it, it's really interesting, you know, the, the pictures that she, of course, and there's 55 different symbols in her book. And, uh, but these are all depression age pictures. So uh, it's, Anybody else want to share? I'm not for sure how long you want this to go on. Sue was making a comment earlier. She was saying, well, we have such a big crowd. And I said, well, did you know they knew that Kinda was only going to talk five minutes? <laughs> steam engines come up back in the late 40s and early 50s and of course coming up the hill would be going slow mm -hmm. and there was one old boy that mom and dad always said mm -hmm. our house is on one side of the tracks the barn is on the other he always stayed in the barn and up the house on the back porch and had two minutes mm -hmm. he did that for years you often wonder if maybe uh, like Art Linkletter and so forth, that all his stories that he had was picked up all along the way and so forth too, you know, the stories. Yes. Somebody over here wanted to say something? My dad was a hobo. Mm -hmm. and he was, it was in 1936 and the crops had failed. Right. It was a drought and the crops had failed. So he and a friend jumped the train and went out west. He had some good pictures. Right. Steam train board? Yes. I met him. Oh, neat. And he gave me a picture of me. Ah. Yeah. I retired from the railroad and that's why I got from the railroad. Mm -hmm. Quite a guy. <laughs> well, they would have had that. I didn't was think anybody would have ever heard of him. Right. He was mentioned in, um, by listing of characters. Yes. Yes. As a child, I lived on Holland Street, <coughs> and TPW ran well, no, no farther away than that window to my back door. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the uh, trains always went certain times, and my grandmother would always have an idea that she was going to be having company. <laughs> There'd be a knock at the back door, and my, we lived with my grandmother. And mm -hmm. uh, sure enough, it'd be a whole ball or two. Mm -hmm wanted to know if they could have something to eat. And as a child, I was real interested in this. You know, I thought this was something. And I always asked, could I help feed them? Mm -hmm. And she said, yes, you can take the plates out, but don't talk to them. I always talk to them. 
grandchild or granddaughter to the movie K Kittredge by um, the American Girl Dolls. In that movie, they have some of the symbols and they were uh, uh, use them in the road. So that was the first uh, time that a lot of little girls this, this day and age knew anything about holding the signs is from that movie, K Kittredge. You did a beautiful job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I didn't do the quilting. I, I did the sewing of it and so forth. But I have a friend, uh, Mrs. Mansfield, that does my quilting for me. And I just do the, have her do the overall pattern. But there's some mistakes, because this was probably one of probably my second or third quilt that I ever made. So I've made lots and more since then. Yes, thank you. Anybody else have a comment? Or? Well, I didn't even know where the term hobo came from. I never thought about it, I guess, but thank you, Tanya. You're very welcome. 